All right, hi everyone. Wow, there was more latency there than well, most of your applications. Uh, how's everyone doing today? I have like the best talk slot because you all just ate, so there's nothing for you to look forward to for the rest of the day. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm not based here in the UK, as you might tell from my accent. Uh, I'm based in the United States. Um, so I'm really excited to be here to talk today about collaborating on infrastructure as code. Um, for those of you that were in the session that was in this room right before this one, there might be a little bit of overlap. Um, for those of you that weren't, great, you're in the right place. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to talk to you about collaborating on infrastructure as code. And the first part of this talk is a little bit different from some talks I've given in the past. Um, the first like five or 10 minutes is actually not very technical. Um, those of you that have seen me do videos or talks before, you know I'm a pretty technical person. But I'm going to focus on the collaboration aspect for just a little bit, because I think it's really important that we're all on the same page about what goal we're trying to accomplish. And then I'm going to move into a live demo and touch the keyboard. But don't worry, I'm feeling fine. Um, it's just a little bit different in the beginning here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Seth. I'm a developer advocate for uh, Google. Prior to that, I was a developer advocate and the director of technical evangelism at HashiCorp. Uh, prior to that, I worked on the community team at Chef. Prior to that, I worked at Custom Inc. So you might recognize me from tools like ChefSpec and Test Kitchen. Um, I've touched every single HashiCorp tool. We're talking about Terraform here today. Um, or more recently, the DevOps and SRE series that I've done with Google with this really cool shirt that says Class SRE Implements DevOps. Um, so with that, um, let's talk about collaboration. So collaboration, as defined by Wikipedia here, is when two or more entities work together to realize or achieve a goal. There's a few things to point out here. Uh, I use the word entity. Wikipedia uses the word humans, and I think that that's a little unfair to our AI gods who are soon to take over the world. Um, you can collaborate with other things that are not humans, right? You can collaborate with a chatbot, right? You can collaborate through technology um, that, that you don't necessarily have to involve a human, right? You can collaborate with your dog or your cat or your fish. And the key is that it involves two or more entities who are coming together to realize a common goal. The common goal is really critical. If you have two people who are working together toward different goals, we call those people enemies, not collaboration, right? The goal, is, the goal has to be shared. You have to be working towards the same common goal or the same common entity. Otherwise, it's not collaboration. So what does collaboration get us? Well, we know from like a number of different studies that collaboration brings a lot of benefits to organizations, businesses, nonprofits, et cetera. Um, so for example, uh, this is data from like three different studies, and I can, I can show the white papers with you if you want, but they found that collaboration leads to engaged employees uh, in things like meetings. You have accelerated velocity of applications and delivery and just uh, deliverables. Uh, higher retention rates is a really interesting one. People are more likely to stay at a company if they feel like they're being listened to and they're collaborating on projects together. It can also lead to really innovative ideas. Um, it turns out when you have a bunch of people who all look the same, act the same, and think the same, they come up with the same ideas. So if you bring a diverse group of people together to collaborate on a project, you often get new and innovative ways to solve problems. We can get things like increased profitability because we can do things you know, cheaper or faster or more efficiently. Um, and it tends to lead to expanded diversity. So it's this interesting circular effect where uh, if you have employees who are engaged, who are engaged and like their job, and they're willing to keep their job, that you're more likely to bring innovative ideas to the table by giving everyone a voice, which can then lead to more diversity and create this cycle where you're constantly innovating. So, collaboration is really good. Does anyone in the room disagree that collaboration on a general scale is pretty good? Cool, because if you did, you're wrong. Um, so, why don't we collaborate all the time? Right? Why? How many people in the room are parents? How many of you, keep your hands up, how many of you have ever uh, had a kid and your kid's doing something and they ask you why and you say, because I said so? Right? It's a very common parenting line, right? Your kids are inquisitive. They want to know why they can't stick the fork in the, the socket in the outlet or why they can't go in that one drawer in the kitchen. Um, and sometimes it's just easier instead of collaborating and teaching. We just say, because I said so, that's the way it is. 
And when we take that, that same conversation and we frame that in terms of like business discussions, right? It's very easy for people in higher level positions, uh, whether those are technical or, or business or marketing, to just, to just not collaborate and not share their ideas and not share their motivations, but instead just say, this is the way it is, this is the way it should be done. And that doesn't mean they're wrong, right? As a parent, when you tell your child not to stick the fork in the outlet, it doesn't mean you're wrong, right? But your child isn't challenging you because they want to you to be wrong, right? They're challenging you because they wanna understand why. Right? Why shouldn't I do it this way? Is there a better way that I can stick the fork in the outlet and not hurt myself, for example? So collaboration is hard. Um, and we, we sometimes, it's easier for us to take on work than it is to just you know, help and do other people. So the reason that it's hard is there's five key pillars for collaboration. Um, no, I didn't miscount. There's only four on the slide right now. Um, the first is time, and that's probably one of the biggest, is that it's really easy to lose time, right? Time is probably one of the most precious things we have as humans, and it's the thing that constantly moves, right? Whether we're sleeping or working or eating, time is constantly moving. It's constantly counting down. So given the opportunity to collaborate, which generally takes more time because it's a teaching opportunity, and just doing it ourselves, we tend to do it ourselves. The second thing is trust, right? In order to collaborate, we have to trust that the information we're sharing with other people is going to be used for non-nefarious purposes or for the good of the business or the, the good of the project. If we don't have that mutually established trust, it's really difficult to collaborate. We also need diversity to collaborate. As I said before, if you put a bunch of people who all think the same, who all look the same, act the same, think the same, have the same background in the same room, they're gonna come to the same conclusion. That's not collaboration. Um, that's just called scaling. Right? If you, in order to collaborate, you have to have diverse backgrounds. And then the second to last collaboration requirement is incentive. There actually has to be incentive to collaborate. Um, this can be monetary incentive. This can be, you know, you're gonna improve the business, you're gonna get a peer bonus, you're gonna get recognition, um, or it could be some, you know, altruistic incentive, right? You're going to change the world, you're going to help someone else better themselves. But the most important piece of collaboration that is often overlooked um, is the need for a shared language. So going back to the earlier example of how do you communicate to a child to not stick a fork in an outlet, um, oftentimes the biggest barrier is language, right? If it's a two-year-old who has a limited vocabulary, how are you going to explain ohms, amps, and voltage to a two-year-old? You simply can't. And that's because there is no shared language. The same is true when we talk about technology. We have to be speaking the same language. And I'll give you an example. Um, this is probably not gonna work because I'm in Europe. So this is the exact same slide, but how many people are still following along? A few of you, right? I could give the rest of this presentation in Spanish. I took six years of Spanish, but that would isolate a subset or a majority of the people in this room. If we don't have a shared language, we can't collaborate on these ideas. We could take it a step even further, and I could give the rest of this presentation in Arabic. I only have about one year of Arabic training, so it would be terrible, but my point still stands, right? We have to have a shared language in order to collaborate. It's a key pillar of collaboration. So without shared language, we can't collaborate. So I know what you're all thinking. What does any of this have to do with infrastructure as code and Terraform, and why is he talking? What is going on? What was in that sandwich? Um, well, it turns out that if we want to collaborate on infrastructure, which is the crux of this talk, we have to zoom in or double click on that shared language component. So there are many existing patterns that, that, that happen in various communities for provisioning and creating and managing infrastructure as code. Um, probably the most dominant one uh, is what I call web UI driven development. Uh, it's where you go in the web console and you click create instance and you type things in, right? And, and this is very, very common, but it's really difficult to collaborate on something like this, right? Unless you're looking over someone's, whole, you know, someone's shoulder or you, know, you can't have two people have their hand on the mouse at the same time. Um, it's really difficult. So some people also use CLI-driven development, right? Terminal-driven development, where we're using tools like you know, G Cloud or the AWS CLI to interact with infrastructure. 
but it's still really difficult to collaborate on this. You have to be using tools like Tmux or Screen to do pairing, which requires additional overhead and additional understanding of the system. These tools uh, or these workflows also have challenges in the sense that they're not really scalable uh, and they, they can't lend themselves well to existing processes. So I'm not trying to convince you that infrastructure as code is a good idea. Every major cloud provider has some kind of infrastructure provisioning software. Um, I'm not going to mention any names here, but what you'll notice is that all three of these, so the left side, the top right, and the bottom right, are completely different. Right? One of them is JSON, two of them are YAML, and like I said, I'm not mentioning any names here to call anybody out, um, but, oh crap. Anyway, my point is that if we want to collaborate on infrastructure, we need to speak the same language. So if we go back to this, if you imagine you're a large organization, you know, thousands of people, and you have some people doing the left side over there, which uh, as you now know is Azure ARM templates, we have the top right, which is Google Deployment Manager, and the bottom right, which is AWS CloudFormation, if, if we have these different ways of describing infrastructure, right, and Oracle and IBM and all of these cloud providers or, or infrastructure providers have their own way or their own tooling that lets you describe infrastructure, if, if we have to learn 15 different languages just to spin up an instance or create a network or manage a firewall, all of a sudden our burden is higher and we can't collaborate as effectively. So we need a shared language in order to describe these infrastructure resources and the relationships between them so that we can better collaborate with one another. So that's the goal of, of Terraform, right? So Terraform is an open source tool. Uh, it's a single static Go binary, runs locally on your machine. Uh, you can think of it kind of like Git, right? Git runs locally. It's not a server that runs somewhere else. It's just a local tool. Um, and it's designed to help manage this complexity of infrastructure and capture infrastructure as code in a single language. So Terraform has this very descriptive DSL. Um, it's just thing, uh, type name, and then the attributes that go with that thing. So let me give you a concrete example. Um, this is a concrete example of how you would create a Google Compute instance that is a Debian 9 base image. What's interesting is that we can take that same configuration and we can apply it to multiple cloud providers. So here I have the exact same configuration. You can see that the attributes are a little different, right? Google Compute uses an image attribute, whereas AWS uses an AMI attribute. Um, I saw an interesting t-shirt that someone's wearing that says AMI is three syllables, like ask me anything. Um, I don't know, do you say AMI or AMI here? Dead crowd. Anyway. Those three letters there, right? So Amazon uses AMI, DigitalOcean Droplet uses image, you know, et cetera. So there are differences between these attributes, but we're using the same language to describe them, right? So it's easier to collaborate on this. Additionally, Terraform can manage uh, things that are beyond the traditional scope of what we would consider infrastructure. Typically when we say infrastructure, we mean compute, networking, and storage. Those are kind of the big three. But what you also see is that as we've had this proliferation of cloud, we started seeing kind of specialized.com or what I call the proliferation of assets, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, uh, everything as a service. So we have things like CDNs as a service, like Fastly and CloudFront and Cloudflare, where we want to configure those as part of our infrastructure, right? We might have our CDN pulling from our infrastructure storage backend, and we want to you know, hook those things up together. And Terraform lets you do that. It can provision things like, you know, in this example, Fastly or CloudFront or Cloudflare. It can also uh, provision things like GitHub Teams and permissions. So it's unlikely that many of you have thought of GitHub as infrastructure as code, but this is something that Terraform can manage. It can actually manage anything with an API. So how many people here have to manage GitHub for their job? Yeah, so when you create users in GitHub or GitHub Enterprise, you have to like go in the UI, you have to click buttons, you have to type things in, or maybe you write a chat bot that does it for you. But at the end of the day, when that person leaves the company, you then have to go back in and you have to delete all of that stuff. With Terraform, you can actually capture all of your relationships between all of these different teams and permissions and repositories and the labels on those repositories as code. You can check that code into source control, and then when someone joins the team or leaves the team, all they have to do is edit that configuration. So when I uh, worked at HashiCorp, this was actually the way that you onboarded 
uh, for a while. You would get access to the HashiCorp organization uh, as a, a new employee, and you would submit a pull request to the Terraform configurations to add yourself to the right teams on GitHub. Your manager would merge that pull request and then Terraform to run, and you would get access to all of the repositories. So if anyone ever wanted to know, oh, who has access to all these repos, they could go in GitHub and look, or they could pull up the Terraform configuration because that's the declarative uh, place where all of these infrastructure resources are declared. So just trying to show you that Terraform can kind of push the boundaries of traditional infrastructure. One of the things you might notice here is this dollar curly brace syntax, which I've highlighted in bold. This is where Terraform's real power comes from. This is Terraform's interpolation syntax. So interpolation is the way in which we reference values from other uh, resources. So in this example, we're taking the GitHub team admins and placing it in the team ID. That's actually a typo on that slide. We're taking this top resource here and we're plugging it in down here. What this does is this tells Terraform that this resource, the GitHub team membership resource, depends on that top resource, the GitHub team. And this makes sense, right? If we, if we don't think about infrastructure for a second, in order for me to add someone to a team, that team has to exist, right? That's pretty straightforward. But when we're provisioning infrastructure as code, it's often challenging to describe these relationships. Terraform's interpolation syntax makes that really straightforward. Terraform uses a DAG, a directed acyclic graph under the hood, to map all these resources, and it will automatically provision them in parallel where possible. So what that means is if you have a you know, cluster of thousands and thousands of machines, it can actually provision those in parallel to reduce provisioning time to you know, five minutes or even 30 seconds to provision all of those machines. The way it does that is by building this DAG. So if you've ever worked with like, you know, Puppet or Chef or, or similar config management tools, you know you have to explicitly say like, this resource depends on this resource or do this before you do that. With Terraform, you don't have to do that. If you're leveraging the interpolation syntax, it'll automatically do that for you. And the interpolation syntax just limits the amount of copying and pasting you have to do. So Terraform is kind of composed of these three uh, entities, the first of which is core. Uh, Terraform core itself is composed of a few different packages. So it's written in Go. It's a single static binary. Um, we have this thing called the parser, which reads configuration. This thing called config, which is the configuration. The DAG, which is a pure mathematical implementation of a directed acyclic graph. It doesn't know anything about Google or Amazon or Azure. It's just a mathematical graph that implements all of the interfaces of a DAG. And then we have schema, which is a helper for building these things that we call providers. Providers are a particular type of plugin in Terraform. So Terraform's core is very separated from its plugin architecture. So what that means is the thing that reads config and actually does diffing on the graph is completely separate and is in fact maintained separately in a separate repository from the thing that talks to Google and the thing that talks to Amazon and the thing that talks to GitHub. We call those things providers, they're, they're a plugin. And what core does is it actually spins up a local gRPC server to talk to those plugins. So if you ever look at the process output of Terraform when it's running, you'll see that the plugins are spawned as uh, basically sub-processes of the main Terraform process, and it's actually sending API calls over gRPC over localhost to those plugins. So in this way, the plugins are actually quite dumb. Um, they don't have any concept of graph theory or dependencies. They just implement very basic create, read, update, and delete operations. So this means if you want to, oops, sorry, if you want to write a plugin for your infrastructure provider or your service, all you need to do is have a client library in Go, and you need to implement create, read, update, and delete. Terraform does all of the difficult stuff with the diff and the apply and the refresh operation, and it correctly decides which operation to run, create, read, update, or delete. So you don't even have to make those decisions. You simply implement this interface, you hook it up to Terraform, and Terraform makes the hard decisions for you. This architecture allows the ecosystem to scale. Uh, last time I looked, there were over 120 Terraform providers, and the, the ecosystem continues to grow. So those plugins then communicate with what we call upstream, which is kind of that third piece of Terraform. These are like the Google Cloud APIs, the AWS APIs, the GitHub APIs. These are things that Terraform doesn't necessarily control, but this is where the interaction takes place. Right? So those are your upstream APIs and services. 
So these are kind of the three main pillars of Terraform. The plugins do the create, read, update, delete. The core does all of the graph theory and the complexity. And then the upstream APIs are where the actual resources are created. Right? So Terraform doesn't actually create an instance. It makes an API call to Google Cloud to create an instance and then verifies that the instance creation was successful. So you might be thinking, like, oh, well, the, this whole mapping of dependencies, that seems like a lot of overkill. So this here, uh, and don't worry, you're not supposed to be able to read this. Just look at kind of the spider web of, of dependencies here. This is a graph that Terraform will produce. It has the ability to produce a graph that will show all of the relationships between your different nodes. Um, this is actually the graph for my personal blog, uh, SethVargo.com. It's like one DigitalOcean instance. It's really not that exciting. But what you'll find is that there's a ton of different things that go into creating an instance. For example, um, on my blog, what I actually do is I leverage Terraform's built-in TLS provider, and I generate new SSH keys each time I create a new deploy of my blog. So each new deploy has a new SSH key, which reduces my surface area for an attack. So these are, again, ways you can pu push kind of the traditional definition of infrastructure, et cetera. So how does Terraform enable you to collaborate better? Well, we've decided that the shared language is important, and Terraform supports pretty much every major cloud service out there. Um, so we have the shared language, but what else? Well, Terraform also separates the planning phase from the applying phase. So in infrastructure, oftentimes you're going to make a change. You're not just initially provisioning resources and forgetting about them. You need to scale up. You need to scale down. You need to change things over time. That can be scary. Um, there are situations where a change to a particular resource might cause it to be deleted and recreated. And that might not be the desired behavior. So what Terraform does is it separates the planning phase, which is the, the place where Terraform looks and does the diff and decides what operations it'll take, from the actual execution phase, which is the apply phase, in which Terraform makes these upstream API calls. This is really important when you start thinking about CI CD because you can add checks and integrations around that plan to make sure that people aren't doing nefarious things. For example, you might have a, a check on the plan file that says if anyone is touching a firewall role, I need someone from the security team to come in and approve these changes. Because Terraform captures infrastructure as code, the moment we have something as code, we get to steal. We get to steal everything that you already have in terms of application pipelines and CI CD pipelines and integration testing and bring that to the infrastructure layer. So if you're already using Travis CI or Circle CI or you know, something like Container Builder, you can automatically bring that workflow that you're using for your Rails application or your Java application to infrastructure. Right? But instead of an application, it's infrastructure. But because we're treating it as code and there's a CLI that allows us to execute that code, we can test it, we can add post integration testing, et cetera. So the whole idea with tools like Terraform is that you, you shouldn't reinvent the wheel. Right? You, you likely already have processes for your application deployments, and you shouldn't have to have some crazy other process just for your infrastructure. Use the same deployment pipelines and the same technologies that you're already leveraging. So it's all about stealing the technologies and the processes that application developers have had for many, many years and bringing it to the infrastructure space, which has traditionally been very manual. There's also this one last thing we have to talk about before we get into the demo, and that's this thing called state. Um, state is kind of like the red-headed stepchild of Terraform. It's like that necessary evil. So let me tell you a bit about state in a slightly different way. If you've ever worked with like Chef or Puppet or, or Ansible and you create a file, so you know, maybe an SSH authorized keys file, and then you go in your Ansible config, your playbook, or your Puppet manifest, and you delete the config lines, the next time Puppet runs or Ansible runs, it won't create that file anymore. But for all of the systems that it's already converged, that file exists. Right? It's not going to go back and delete it. You have to explicitly add like action equals delete to your manifest or your playbook to, to tell the configuration management software, hey, go delete this file. And then you have to leave it in there until convergence hopefully, hopefully happens. The reason that needs to happen is that the, those tools don't have a, a, a database of sorts of knowing what did and did not occur. So they don't know if they previously managed that file. The way Terraform gets around that is by using state. 
So if you want to delete a resource that Terraform is managing, all you do is delete it from your config. Terraform then knows that you wanted to delete that resource. So what this means is you get a truly declarative uh, representation of your infrastructure. What's in that file is what exists, right? And, and that's where state comes in. But at the same time, state is very, very important, which means you often have to manage it, you have to back it up, you have to keep it up to sync, especially if you're working in a team. Um, and for that reason, the state is like pluggable. You can store the state in a file, you can store it in something like etcd or Google Cloud Storage, et cetera. Uh, I'll tweet out the slides so you don't have to write all this stuff down. Um, but this is how Terraform makes decisions based on the state file. So just to kind of highlight a few here, um, if the state is what's in the state, the config is what's in your local Terraform config, and the reality is what's out on the cloud, like, like Google or Amazon, um, if a resource exists in the state, exists in the config, and exists in reality, Terraform does nothing. And the other one that's interesting is that if nothing exists in the state and nothing exists in the config, but it does exist in reality, Terraform does nothing. So to translate that, Terraform only manages resources it knows about. So it's safe to use Terraform on existing environments or existing projects because it's only going to manage the things that it has been told to manage. Additionally, Terraform is idempotent. So if everything is correct, Terraform will do nothing. If for some reason something is wrong, Terraform will resolve the diff to bring the configuration in line with reality. OK, so with that, let's do demo time. Who's excited? Wow, no one is excited. <laughs> was pretty sad. Are you sure? I don't have to do a demo. All right, so I have this really handy folder named demo. So what I've done here, uh, and I, I tweeted this out last night, is um, I'm going to show you how you can collaborate on infrastructure as code using GitHub with a tool called Atlantis, which is an open source tool. Um, but first, I'm going to show you just a little bit of Terraform. So what I have here is I'm going to source my little env. Uh, all right. So what I have here first is a Terraform configuration file that uses Google Cloud Storage as my state backend. So instead of storing my state locally in a file, I'm storing it in Google Cloud Storage. I could be storing this in etcd or other resources, but uh, this is a pluggable system. But I'm going to use Google Cloud Storage because Atlantis is also running on Google Cloud, so I'll get some performance benefits there. What I also have is this uh, config file that's creating a Google Compute firewall, and below it, a Google Compute resource. So basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a firewall that allows port 80 uh, from any source to hit any resource tagged web. So I have this firewall. Anything that comes in on port 80 from any IP range, that's what the zero slash CIDR is for, will automatically be round robin to anything tagged web. And then, as you might guess, down here, I have an instance. And that instance is tagged web. It's very shocking, I know. Um, <clears throat> it's running in Europe, because that's where we are. Um, and then I'm initializing it with a Debian 9 instance. And I'm giving it a public IP address. And then here, what you'll see I'm doing is I'm installing uh, Nginx. So just a straightforward web server. And that's just so I can show you that it's actually working. Um, and then I'm using Terraform outputs to give me the IP address of this instance whenever it's provisioned. So kind of backing up outside of the context of Terraform, if I were to do this manually, I'd have to log into the Google Cloud Console. I'd have to create an instance. I'd have to allow HTTP access to that instance through the firewall. It's like 15 clicks last time I checked. Uh, it's also really difficult to collaborate on this, right? I can't like stand over your shoulder and be like, no, 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 click three pixels to the left. Click three pixels to the left, right? It doesn't work that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start this. And I'm going to run Terraform plan first. And I alias Terraform to TF because I hate typing. Um, make this just a little bit smaller. OK, hopefully that's still big enough that you all can see it. So what we have up here is the, the firewall. So Terraform's done nothing at this point. It is planned, which guarantees, Terraform kind of has this guarantee that it won't touch infrastructure during a plan. So we've planned the changes that will take place. Here we can see a, a green plus sign, which means Terraform is going to create that resource. And then there's a bunch of these attributes here, some of which I filled in, like the, the demo firewall and the ports that are allowed. And some of them are the default values. And the same is true for the instance. It's going to create the instance. 
And you'll notice there's a lot of these things that look like these HTML computed tags. These are values that Terraform won't know until it creates the resource. So things like the public IP address or the private IP address, those are assigned by the cloud provider DHCP server. We don't know those in advance. So Terraform will mark them as computed, and then whenever Terraform runs and gets those values, it'll fill them in for future runs. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and run Terraform apply. You'll notice that it does this thing at the top. It acquires the state lock, the very first thing it took. This prevents multiple people from running Terraform simultaneously. So if you imagine two people are running Terraform at the same time, they might conflict, right? They may be modifying the same resources. This could get in a bad state. So right now, I've acquired this kind of mutually exclusive lock on the state. Terraform again shows me the plan and says, are you sure this is what you want to do? And I say yes. So this takes like a minute and a half. So I'm going to keep talking through this. Um, in, in speaker school, this is what we call burning time. Um, but what Terraform is doing is it's making the API calls to GCP to create the firewall, add the port uh, fire forwarding roles to the firewall, create the instance, open up the ports on the instance so that the forwarding role can hit, and then it's going to use instance metadata or, or basically user data to uh, update the apt cache and install Nginx so that hopefully when, the, when this Terraform run is complete, I'll have an IP address at the end. And if I wait long enough for Nginx to install and burn enough time, this IP address will show you the Welcome to Nginx page. Um, so let's see. Do a little control clicky. See, look, Welcome to Nginx. Um, and you can try this if you want. That's the IP address, 35205.176.1. Um, and that's how quickly you can provision an Nginx server with a firewall on port 80, and I talk to you the whole time. Um, what's important is this whole thing is captured as code. So we can iterate on it. We can change it. We can work together to alter the configuration. You can imagine that instead of this being Nginx, this was your application that was already bundled inside a custom image. Or perhaps you could use you know, something like Kubernetes to deploy this onto a GKE cluster uh, in a Docker container. But all of, the, all of the processes are still the same. right? It's still Terraform plan and ter still Terraform apply which is really one of Terraform's main selling points, is that it doesn't matter what technology you're using, the workflow is still the same. It doesn't matter if you're working with Google or Amazon or Microsoft or Closet Cloud. Uh, how many people have a Closet Cloud? Do you know what Closet Cloud is? It's like that one server that's really important that no one touches. Um, right? It doesn't matter because Terraform provides the same workflow. So let me show you kind of how Terraform evolves as your team evolves. So right now I'm one person. I ran Terraform by myself, and that's really exciting. But if I wanted to collaborate on this, I have to have multiple personalities and kind of show you what this might look like on the infrastructure as code level. So in order to use infrastructure as code, GitHub, uh, we need some type of source control repository here. So what I have is this GitHub repo that actually directly corresponds to that code that I just showed you. So if we take a look at that state.tf, you'll see it looks very similar. Um, if we take a look at the main.tf, you'll see, again, the compute firewall and the compute instance. It's the same. Just trust me. It's fine. Um, what I want to show you, though, is like if I wanted to make a change, so if I work in a team, and perhaps we need to scale up our instance, right? This Nginx server is on the front page of Hacker News. It's getting hit super hard, and we need more bandwidth. We need more scalability. How might we do that? Well, my teammate might come in, and they might submit a pull request. So I'm going to use the GitHub UI because I'm cheating. Um, but you can imagine this would be done locally. So I'm going to go ahead in here, and I'm going to scale this up to an N1 standard 2. Um, so I changed this line right here. And I'm going to create a new branch and open a pull request on that branch. So instead of committing directly, because we shouldn't ever do that, you never push to master directly, at least not without dash force. Um, some of you got the joke. Um, and I'm going to open this pull request, right? So this pull request is open. We can take a look here. We can see, oh, yeah, this looks like we need to scale up. Um, you know front page of Hacker News. Um, and what I can do is I can actually ask this open source tool called Atlantis to execute Terraform for me. So I have my little Atlantis bot in here. Um, and I can ask Atlantis bot to plan. And this is where we hope that the demo works. Um, so what will happen is in the background, hopefully, Atlantis bot will download my Terraform configuration 
and put the plan output. Whew, it worked. It was like edgy there for a second. Um, it will actually put the plan output here directly in the pull request, preserved for history. So next, a year from now, when someone comes in and is like, why did you make this change? You can actually see the plan and in a bit the apply output that made these changes. So in addition to seeing the infrastructure changes, we can see the changes that Terraform said it would make. Here you can see that we're going from an N standard one to an N one standard two. And Terraform says it's gonna add zero resources, change one and destroy zero resources. So this is, looks pretty good to me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and apply this. So I'm gonna say Atlanta spot apply. And this takes a little bit. This takes about a minute and a half to two minutes and we won't see anything while that's happening. Um, this is still a kind of an early project that people are working on, um, but it's still really cool. So again, I'm burning time until the output comes here. But what Terraform is gonna do is, is, so Atlantis is running in GKE. I can actually show you that. So GKE is the Google Kubernetes engine. Um, so we have Atlantis running in GKE. It's running in a container. There's an official container. Let me make this bigger. So it's running in GKE in a container. Um, we can like look at the logs and stuff for it. Uh, but it has a public IP address, so it has a, a Kubernetes service attached to it. That service has a load balancer. That load balancer has a public IP. Um, I'm using self-signed TLS certs, um, but you can see that here uh, in the web UI, there's a lock. So Atlantis has acquired a lock on that repo because it's running Terraform right now, so it's running that Terraform apply. So what happens is whenever I ping that Atlantis bot, GitHub sends a webhook to this IP address. Um, that IP address reads the webhook, validates the secret, and kicks off a Terraform plan inside this Docker container. It already has Terraform and stuff installed. So it's gonna download the configurations, it's gonna execute the plan and the apply automatically, and then it's gonna post the results through the comments API back on the website, uh, on the, the GitHub pull request. Have I wasted enough time? Have not wasted enough time. It's okay, I can keep talking. Um, <clears throat> So this Kubernetes cluster and, and kind of that load balancer IP is accessible from anywhere, uh, which is good because GitHub needs to be able to hit it from anywhere. Um, there's obviously improvements to be made where it would stream this output so you're not awkwardly standing in front of an audience talking while it's waiting for it to finish. But you can see here what happened was the machine type went from N1 standard one to N1 standard two. It took about a minute and a half. It was pretty accurate, a minute and 27 seconds uh, to change that resource. And if we go back into the Google Cloud Console now, um, and I switch over to the compute engine, what you'll see is that this resource type, this demo instance, which is the one that we're messing with here, is now an N1 standard two. It was previously an N1 standard one. So Terraform's actually managing this resource for me. I can go ahead and merge this since it was successful, and now it's on the mainstream master branch. You can do things like require uh, that approval takes place. So if you're familiar with the GitHub pull request model, right, you can require that someone has actually come in and approved this pull request before the actual application step will take place. So this means you, know, you need two or three people to say yes to the pull request before it'll run, that's great. The other advantage to using something like Atlantis versus running Terraform locally is that with Atlantis or any type of Terraform service, you centralize all the credentials. So uh, Atlantis actually uses GCP application default credentials. So it, it uses the instance credentials to authenticate. If I run Terraform locally, I need a credentials file. So if we go back to the terminal, you'll see that I actually have this credentials JSON that I have locally, which is how I'm talking to GCP locally. So if you have thousands of developers or even hundreds of developers and you need them all to talk to a service, it's easier to centralize the service and the authentication to the cloud providers and the upstream resources inside one place than to try to distribute these credentials to everyone. And then you just provide this as a service, right? So you could be running Terraform in something like Jenkins or uh, CircleCI or TeamCity or, or et cetera, uh, providing it as a service where all of the credentials to talk to these cloud providers are centralized so that individual teams or individual developers don't need access to all of the credentials. Um, cool. So I have one more slide, um, which is the kind of summary slide. So if you want to know how to run Atlas on GKE, uh, I published a set of Terraform configurations. It's a little bit meta. It uses Terraform to configure a GKE cluster with Atlantis. It automatically creates a GitHub repo. That GitHub repo automatically gets linked back to Atlantis, but then it also uses Terraform to write out a set of Terraform configs that is the demo. 
Um, so it's very meta. If you're curious about Terraform and you're like, I have no idea what this guy said, but I want to learn more, you can go here. Um, if you're curious about Atlantis and you have no idea what this guy said, you can go to uh, that website doesn't work anymore, actually. Let me fix it. You can go to this website, which is runatlantis.io. Uh, and if you're curious about Google Cloud or any of the stuff I showed you with GKE or GCE, you can go to cloud.google.com. So with that, I have 10 minutes for questions. Way in the back. So the question is, why would you commit to master after you deployed your changes? This is a really good question. Um, why would you commit to master before making sure that your changes applied successfully is the, the reverse question, right? So this is kind of a preference thing. Um, I don't want anything in master that is not true. So if I merge to master, um, keeping in mind that there's a global lock that's taking place. If I merge to master and then I'm waiting for Terraform to apply, no one else can commit to master during that time. Right? So I've effectively blocked the deploy train or the infrastructure deploy chain during that time. If instead I apply my changes on the pull request and then merge, the history shows uh, basically a successful CI-CD run. Right? I did the CI, which is the Terraform plan. And then I did the continuous delivery, which is the application. And now that's merged on master. Um, there's a lot of uh, enhancements that can be made to Atlantis. It's still an early open source project. So one of the top requested features is to auto merge on successful apply. Uh, and that is in the pipeline. So uh, I'm not actually one of the maintainers, but um, I, I kind of follow the project closely because I use it in a lot of demos and talks. But yeah, it's a great question. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement and a lot of room for preference around kind of what, what is the source of truth. Other questions? Yeah? I have two pull requests, and I run them one by one, different changes, but they did not sync to master. How does it work together? So you can't run them at the same time, because Atlantis won't let you. One so, by one. Right. So what will happen is whenever you merge the first one, right, you, can, you would then go back and run the second one. The idea is that you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't run two at the same time, basically. So you would merge, rebase, rerun Terraform again. So you need to be careful to rebase before you actually want to merge or run the Terraform? Yes, but you need to be less careful than if you're doing it locally. Because if you're doing it on something like GitHub or GitLab, um, which Atlantis also integrates with, you have a centralized view of what everyone's working on. But if people are running locally, right? If, if I'm in the UK and you're in the US, I have no idea what, what command you're about to run on your laptop. Right? So the idea is that by having it in pull requests and issues, it's more visible to everyone. Um, so you're less likely to have that type of conflict. Other questions? Yeah, sorry, it's really bright. Yeah, so the question is, how do you test your Terraform configurations? Can you, uh, can you spend less money by using smaller instances or smaller resources and then scale up when you know it works? Um, there's no built-in uh, kind of testing framework to Terraform. So uh, the Terraform plan is the closest to a test that you'll get. Um, what you described of like kind of spinning up a scaled down model uh, is achievable through variables. So you can parameterize your Terraform templates um, so in the case of GCP, right, you might have a variable that is like instance type. And in your staging environment, you might set that to like the tiniest little micro instance. Um, but then in prod, that might be like a larger compute optimized or memory optimized instance. Um, so you can control these with like what are called variable sets across different environments or different workspaces in Terraform to manage that. Um, but there is no like automated way to like scale down and scale up. Uh, it's very kind of manual. And the reason for that is like, there is no T2 micro equivalent on GCP and AWS, uh, or GCP and, and Azure, right? It's, it's difficult to map those equivalents. So being able to scale up and scale down is a very uh, manual thing that you decide. Other questions? Yeah? Can you talk louder? Sorry. 
Ah, uh, so the question is, can you pass variables through Atlantis using Git? Yes, and I don't remember how, but you can. So there's other commands that you can run besides plan and apply. Um, let me see here. Run Atlantis. Var. Yeah, there you go. So you can specify the, uh, yeah, that's what it is. So everything after the double dash gets passed directly to the Terraform. So in this case, you could do double dash and then dash var foo equals bar. So you can pass those in uh, either directly through uh, the pull request or you could use like a var file or something like that. Yeah. Right now it supports GitHub and GitLab. Uh, it does not to the best of my knowledge. But it's, it's written in a pluggable way. Right, so because they support GitHub and GitLab and GitHub Enterprise and GitLab on prem. Um, so I don't see why it couldn't, but um, it doesn't right now. It was actually developed by some folks at Hootsuite, which is a social media management platform for their kind of uh, Terraform needs. And then they open sourced it. And then the person who uh, was one of the original authors actually left Hootsuite to go work on Atlantis full time. So. Uh, the question was is there support for Bitbucket? Uh, other questions? Going once. Going twice. I have four minutes. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah? Uh, is there a way to manage the locking without doing Atlantis? Is there a way to manage the locking without doing the Atlantis? Uh, kind of. So Terraform state itself supports locking if the underlying backend supports locking. So. For example, if you're using Google Cloud Storage, it automatically supports locking. So if two people try to run Terraform at the same time against the same GCS bucket, one of them will fail. It'll say, hey, Terraform's in process. Uh, and if you were in the previous session, you saw that the, the presenter actually had to unlock the state manually. There's a command to, to do that. Atlantis provides kind of an additional locking layer above just locking the state. It has its own locks, which prevent two people from running Atlantis simultaneously. So, for example, um, if you weren't using Google Cloud Storage as the remote state backend, if you were just using the file system, it's storing locally on the Docker container that's running Atlantis, Atlantis would still prevent two runs from happening simultaneously, um, even though the file backend itself doesn't support that. Other questions? I think I have three minutes left now. I told you at the beginning time, it just continuously clocks down. All right, well, if there's no other questions, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll be here if there's questions you didn't feel comfortable asking in front of everyone. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter or tweet me any questions. Thank you.